supremely fun. It's Sunrise with Craig Vronick right here on KCMX AM 880. Lively conversations around news, politics, and people, plus local news and weather every 30 minutes. We want to hear from you. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or go to kcmxam.com. Join in the conversation by calling 541-772-8255. Sunrise, where it matters what you think. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Sunrise Show. Seven minutes after the hour. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. About 65 degrees. Interesting temperature is what they're talking about. Going to maybe get to 69. Maybe that's because we got some rain coming in. I don't know exactly, but I will take every drop of rain we can get our hands on. Well, thrilled to welcome into the studio. Uh, boy, I've been chatting with these two individuals, and I'm laughing my head off, and his stories just go abound. And uh, first want to introduce uh, the lab director for the uh, National Fish and Wildlife uh, Forensics Laboratory located in Ashland, Ken Goddard. And of course, been there for a number of years, and it's a fascinating place, and thankful that Ken has a chance to get in. Uh, of course, gets pulled into Washington, D.C. every once in a while, but mostly handles all of the uh, mailed, I, I guess you'd exhibits, evidence, forensic evidence from around the world, from agents, federal agents all over the world, uh, related to poaching and all those different things, illegal activities, and he is the center of that. I also want to welcome in uh, uh, Dave Sidden, Jr. He's the executive director of Wildlife Images over in Merlin. You can get to uh, the website, wildlifeimages.org, and Dave's been a frequent guest on our show, and all kinds of things happening. But, uh, Ken, I want to welcome you into the studio. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in, and, and Dave, great to have you in here. And Boy, uh, you guys, this is really a fantastic opportunity to talk about the relationship between wildlife images and the National Forensics Laboratory. Who wants to start? I... We, I, we probably should explain that we've never been allowed to do this before. That's uh, true, yeah. <laughs> there, there may be a very good reason. We'll find out. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, Ken, uh, talk about the National Forensics Laboratory and what the use is because you've got evidence and you, you, you are inundated every day of the week with evidence and it's always uh, remnants, uh, leftovers, dead animals, feathers, right? Bones, those kind of things, tusks all around the world and yet... We're dealing with wildlife images, and they deal with nothing but live animals. So, Wildlife images is a source of mental health for us, I think. We're dealing with pieces, parts, products, uh, dead stuff. Uh, our, one of our jobs is to figure out what the victim is before we can determine if a crime has been committed. Then we try to use the evidence to link suspect, victim, and crime scene. And some of the stuff is pretty horrific. Some of it is pretty stupid. Uh, it gets depressing after a while. and. Uh, Dave's dad started the whole thing so, you know, when I was down there uh, groundbreaking for the lab. Uh, he walked up to me in a, this leather fringe jacket of his, looking like something out of the, the forest area, and said, the federal government's going to drive you nuts, aren't they? <laughs> and I said, yeah, probably. Uh, he said, that starts happening, uh, wildlife images, you got an open invitation. And sure enough, it wasn't long before my boss started driving me nuts. <laughs> and uh, I called him up and said, hey, can I come out there? I'd like to see what you're doing. Well, that started this interesting friendship with his dad, and then uh, Dave and I he got to meet each other, and we've been having fun ever since. Yeah, it's a long-time relationship, and, and uh, you got to meet Grizz, and... That's one way of putting it, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he got to meet Grizz, for sure. <laughs> you know, so, so Dave, this is a great opportunity for you as well, because of the forensic side of things, and and all of the great work. I mean, you've been at uh, SeaWorld, you're up at the Portland Zoo for years, and then you come down to manage your, your father's uh, business, your, fa your father's dream at Wildlife Images, and, and then lo and behold, you've got this world-acclaimed National Forensics Laboratory. Uh, the next thing is uh, the relationship. How does that, explain that a little bit. Well, my father was sort of like a bigger-than-life sort of character with a thousand stories, so uh, 
he and Ken hit it off immediately. Um, <laughs> gosh, it was when they uh, hadn't even broken ground on the lab yet, they became friends. And I was up at the Oregon Zoo. I'd been there uh, about 12 years. Um, and uh, my father was telling me about the lab and Ken and all that. So I came down and met Ken and got a chance to get exposed directly to the lab. And, you know, it's sort of like if James Bond did wildlife, you know, all the coolest, yeah. neatest, uh materials and the best of the best as far as the scientists there are it's an amazing facility and uh, I leaned on them a little bit at the zoo too because we were creating something called the Congo Ranger Station it's a live living history um, area there that's sort of like if you're to walk into a ranger station out in the rainforest of Africa this might be what you see well at the time they had some old forensics materials some of which were kind of spooky <laughs> and Ken wanted to get rid of. <laughs> and so we were able to get it at the, the zoo and incorporate it into the design. There was, you know, things like chimp skulls and totems and uh, strange things from... Voodoo masks, as I recall. That's right, voodoo masks and things <laughs> as well. It caused all kinds of mayhem at the lab, <laughs> from what I understand. Uh, and those things still are living at the zoo as part of that living history program. I left the zoo eight, oh, 17 years ago now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can only imagine as this... Uh, works into um, guests at Wildlife Images. I mean, the forensics laboratory can, that's a federal um, installation and you don't take tours. Sadly, we're not able to do so for uh, a number of reasons. One is the uh, privacy of suspects, uh, the security of the evidence, and we have uh, potential disease vector issues. We get things from all over the world. We've got to be extremely careful with things. Uh, as a result, we don't dare have kids breaking loose from, uh, you know, a mother and grabbing at something that we still don't know what it is. So we, we don't have that way of engaging with the public easily, and that's where uh, our friendship uh, popped in. Dave said, hey, you know, we do this all the time. What do you think? And it, uh, Wildlife Images is a wonderful place uh, for our story to be told. Uh, and uh, we've been doing this for quite some time now. And, and so, yeah, and as you work that, and of course the tours and the people that come through Wildlife Images, it's just that much better of an experience, and and you can take your your knowledge and apply it to the tours at Wildlife Images. It's fascinating. Well, we're planning on creating actually a, a walkthrough video tour of our laboratory, which will be available at Wildlife Images, and uh, their volunteers can explain what's going on in there and then Dave can always add his two cents. We, I love okay. having him come through the laboratory because not only does he know what's going on there, he likes to make things up as he's going through. <laughs> 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 Trying to make the stories more interesting. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, he, and, and making the stories more interesting is fascinating because what, another thing, Dave, that you've talked about is an interactive uh, tour at Wildlife Images, uh, explain that. With the, I mean, the grant, there's a possibility of a grant coming through to offer that uh, interactive tour with folks as they are on scene there. Yeah, we're trying to raise the bar with our educational programming, what we offer on grounds, give people more depth of the wildlife experience. You know, the, our first line, of course, is to get people to experience animals one-on-one. -on -one. That first contact is critical. But there's a lot of things that they don't understand that goes on behind the scenes to keep a healthy animal population going out in the wild. Some of the forensics evidence and the materials that they are generated from the lab and the things that they do are amazing. And the public rarely gets exposed to that and the research they've conducted and the facilities. Um, it's pretty neat. And if the people, the public now can come to us, get kind of a virtual tour of the lab as we're gearing up and we're going to be getting more and more grants to improve this educational capacity and have a facility where we can conduct uh, off-site research that the lab can use at our place when they need live specimens or to collect hair or fur or blood or whatever it is so you know, all to, those things can be available. To be able to vary a diet one of the things we're looking at is stable isotopes that are in the soil that go into the plants and the uh, herbivores eat and have the same ratios the carnivores eat the herbivores have get the same ratios of stable isotopes yeah, so we can tell where something came from and dave is going to allow us to do this research because we can uh, change diets on those animals and see what happens with stable isotopes yeah see this is fast i mean this is just kind of i you know tip of the iceberg as far as uh you know all of the um science and research you could possibly do on this I would think that the federal agents from around the world, this is going to get their attention as well. Well, hopefully. We've taken on something new, which is trying to figure out where a plank came from. 
what species it, it is. I mean, if you have a tree, you can generally figure out what you've got. The Doug fir is pretty obviously a Doug fir. Right. But if you've got a 2 by 4 by 8 foot stud, uh, it's not necessarily obvious you know, what the species of that is, and there's 150,000 possible species of trees. Uh, so we're trying to work that out with uh, morphology and uh, genetics, and this is something else we may be able to work with because they've got quite a collection of trees out there. Uh, well, yeah, and, and part of this whole education, I mean, it's Wildlife Images and Rehabilitation Center, and uh, you, you can go to the website, wildlifeimages.org. But I tell you, uh, Dave, this is great related to um, research for uh, school age, you know, but middle school, high school, but also college students now. I mean, you're now going to be reaching into this this research, and as you build this this new, um, I'm not going to call it an event center, but more of a, what would you call that, that main area? Well, we're looking at, the, I don't know that we really have a proper label for it, but it would be a, a, a pretty good-sized building that we want to get a grant for that would incorporate research, the rehabilitation, the education, and uh, our retail area. So hopefully three parts of that will generate revenue to support the uh, hospital end, which always uses revenue. So yeah. we try to make everything as uh, balanced as we can when we're building out there. One of the things we did was set up a CSI uh, uh, what, training program uh, for wildlife, and it was a lot of fun. We uh, had some interesting uh, fake animals and walked ourselves through the paces. I love that. We've got uh, Ken Goddard, he's the uh, lab director for the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Forensics Laboratory in Ashland in the city with us this morning. We've also got Executive Director Dave Sidden from Wildlife Images uh, talking about the relationship there and this upcoming research center there at Wildlife Images. We've got to take a quick little break. We'll be right back. More on the Sunrise Show after we return. will return in a moment on KCMX News Talk 880. A little bold and extremely fun Monday through Friday 6 to 9 a.m. on KCMX AM 880. Lively conversations around news, politics, and people, plus local news and weather every 30 minutes. Here's Craig. everybody welcome back 21 minutes after the hour continuing on with uh, the lab director from fish and wildlife in the forensics laboratory in ashland ken goddard and then dave uh, sidden jr the executive director for wildlife images and we were just talking during the break one of the most uh, fascinating things that both dave and ken have uh, realized is that international visitors when they come to wildlife images and uh, ken has just had an international delegation visit the laboratory from the Philippines, uh, come and, and, and see, th they're, they're astounded. They don't have any words to describe because this is a once in a lifetime, they've never seen anything like this in their lives. And here we have this in our lives every day that we can go out. So Ken, what, it, were the, what was the takeaway from this Filipino uh, organization that came well, through? Well, it was with Asus Perez. He is the equivalent of our Fish and Wildlife Service Director. I met Asus uh, several years ago when I was trying to apply CSI techniques to damaged coral reefs. And I had to learn to quickly scuba dive so I could do it, work underwater, and Asus shows up at, at Cozumel with less training than I had, which was really scary. Um, and the two of us kind of matched up there. Dave was supposed to be there. We were hoping he was going to record the whole thing. But Asus has gone from being a, a prosecutor, which he was at the time, to now the head of their Fish and Wildlife Service. And there's now a memorandum of agreement that we're going to uh, train their wildlife rangers um, and uh, try to set up a wildlife forensics facility out there at the Philippines. They're going to come here for, uh, so we can train their trainers and hopefully I can do a lot of that work out of wildlife images because we've got the environment and the people and a lot of it's live animals, you know, right. how they handle. We've, we've made mistakes in handling wild animals before um, with peregrines specifically. Um, I, peregrine uh, falcons. You wouldn't want to make a mistake with a peregrine falcon. Well, you don't want to bend over under looking under a bench <laughs> uh, and, and have the uh, falcon land on you. And if that happens, this happened to an agent who was right next to me, you really don't want to reach back for it quickly. 
because the Falcons tend to dig in with their talents. I can't even imagine what went on after that. I, a lot of screaming, actually. I, a uh, lot of, yeah. uh, Historical laughter. <laughs> uh, we really needed somebody like Dave there. Uh, and, well, we had a problem with drawing blood, too. That was, yeah. yeah. But, but it's interesting that these international visitors, they come, and they, they get to see this, and it's it's a once in a lifetime situation, but now with this memorandum, this, excuse me, this memorandum of agreement with the Philippines, and you know with the Philippine government, this is something else. And they also toured wildlife images, and Dave, they got to see that as well. And so once again, this interaction, this is a very valuable piece. Uh, people are amazed by this. Well, I think it gives a kind of a different spin on you know North Americans' reverence for wildlife. You know, you rarely see that in other countries. Typically, in most other parts of the world, wildlife is just a consumable, and that's it. You know, it really doesn't add anything to their lives. They see here, and they, they come here and hear about wildlife rehabilitation. The whole idea just seems weird to most uh, foreign countries. We worked a lot with Japan, and the idea that you're doing wildlife rehabilitation, they just didn't get it. So they came out and spent time at Wildlife Images, and they got an idea of why we're doing it and how amazing it is to be able to work with these wild animals and ensure they're going to be there for future generations. Our agents will often, often seize live wildlife and they can't be released right away. Uh, so having someone like Dave available to assess the animal, you know, is, is it able to get back out in the wild? What has to be done? Or is it too badly imprinted so you just can't release it safely? Uh, yeah. we, we need that expertise. This is, this is an incredible opportunity, I mean, worldwide, right? The agents are worldwide. And Dave, you, you could take a call at any given moment forwarded from uh, Ken's shop and say, hey, we've got an agent in such and such, and they need help with this, boom, there you are. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things we really don't want to handle. Um, we had, I had some 300 uh, macaws I was supposed to draw blood from, and I made a tragic error <laughs> thinking they weren't smart. Now, you went on scene at this I point. I went on, on scene, and they were all in cages surrounding us, and we thought there was a table there in the middle. We thought, that's a great and place. And you're going to draw blood from a live bird. Several, and so we laid it down. It was, it was used to being handled, and it, we held its wings down, and it's kind of talking to us, and we stabbed a needle in its neck. We then had a, a two-pound <laughs> grizzly bear in our hands that was extremely upset. Not really, we didn't realize the other 299 birds were watching the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Three days later, we were absolutely deafened, uh, cut to pieces, uh, every piece of clothing we had covered with parrot poop. We could, have, we, we could have used someone like Dave on site. I can't even I can't even begin to imagine what that what that chaos was like. Oh, it was memorable. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, um, it's just fantastic, and of course, we have a great opportunity to tour wildlife images and take advantage of that. And you know, Dave, the volunteers that are out there—I talked about this earlier. You know, they they spend so much time behind the scenes. Um, handling the animals, the, the hospital that's there. Uh, people from all over the region bring animals night and day to wildlife images. I mean, the numbers are staggering. You said you handle over a thousand animals a year. Absolutely. Over a thousand animals a year on intake. Not a lot of them survive because they've been hit by vehicles or damaged or things like that. And, and it's uh, 30, let's see, 50% of the animals don't make it, but then, mo what is it, 70% of those animals are released back into the wild? I right, believe. so our ratios are extremely high for a rehabilitation center. Typically, most rehab centers run about 30%. Um, we're over 50 and doing better every year. So we really are proud of our ratio and what we're doing. It's a, a huge thing to be able to do. And, you know, we have to do it as privateers. There's no funding for state or federal uh, agencies to pay for that. So we have to come up with uh, the money every year to pay for the vet bills, the medication, the staff, uh, all those other things that make the thing work. Yeah. Dave, we've got a phone call coming in. Let's see okay. if we can't get this. Good morning. You're live on the air. Who's this? Good morning, Craig. Hey, how are you hey, doing? Your two guests are just wonderfully informative and entertaining. And you've got a gentleman there by the name of Ken Goddard that is a wonderful author. Whoa. Oh, I, that's right. Yes. I, mean, I didn't pay him to say this. The two of them ought to joint venture a book on their experience, <laughs> both serious and humorously, and put it out for publication. It's wonderful to listen to these two people interplay seriously and with fun with each other. So well, I have to admit that's all I have to say. All right. Goddard, I love your book. Thank oh, you, Oh, wow. Fantastic. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, you Dwayne. Bet. Thanks for the call. Well, I have to admit, we you have bet. too much fun together. I'm not sure we'd ever get around to actually working. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it would be tough. <laughs> well, and, and we didn't mention that, and we've got a break coming out in about a minute, but uh, Ken, you do have authored a few books. Yeah, they, they were mental health early on when I was doing police uh, homicide investigations to get stuff out of my head. Now I just have fun with it. You know, what would be evidence of extraterrestrial contact? And the federal government didn't fire me for writing it. I <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something? Well, you know, it's, it, it's great to have, I mean, a federal employee in my office this morning. It's fantastic. Uh, Is this and, unusual? And, and, yeah. <laughs> with a badge and everything. <laughs> I know it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got uh, Ken Goddard in the studio with us. He's the uh, lab director for the National uh, Fish and Wildlife, the Forensics Laboratory. And then uh, Dave Sidden, the executive director for Wildlife Images in the studio as well. And talking about their relationship together and what the laboratory, the Forensics Laboratory and Wildlife Images are going to do together as far as a uh, research. I'm not even going to call it a research institute, but I could. Yeah, you could. I mean, yeah. it, very easily, because we're yeah. talking about research as it goes, and this would be, um, can you only imagine high school students or college students from around the Northwest being able to come and see this? this well, we a... get them from all over the world. We have them from Denmark, all over the world we've had interns. That's just fantastic. I mean, fantastic. So we'll continue with this interview right after the break. News and weather is coming up next. Glad you're hanging out with us this morning. Going to be about 69 today, unless the rain comes in. We'll see what happens there. Right back. Stay tuned. Sunrise will return in a moment on KCMX News Talk 880. We want to hear from you. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or go to KCMXAM.com and go to the Talk to Us tab. Send us your thoughts. Lively conversations around news, politics, and people, plus local news and weather every 30 minutes. Welcome back. 33 minutes after the hour, continuing with uh, Ken Goddard, who's the uh, lab director for the National uh, Forensics Laboratory in Ashland, and executive director Dave Sidden uh, from Wildlife Images. You go to wildlifeimages.org. Fantastic. And we haven't had a chance to talk about Camp Eek. I mean, all the educational things going on out there. Wildlife Images, it's fantastic. And, of course, I can't even imagine being a kid and having an opportunity to go to camp with wild, live animals like that. I just... I, uh, Dave, it just, it's unbelievable to me that, uh, how is camp going out there? Oh, the camp is doing amazing. Last year we had a really bad year because of the fires and all the smoke. This year they're making up for it. I think this week we have 23 campers in uh, Camp Eek, and it's amazing times. And we've got more animals for them to interact with and deal with now I just um, than more than ever. And uh, they get to ride our new, our new bus. Yeah, you know, the expedition the transport, expedition. right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, through Grants Pass, it's making different stops. So tell us the stops real quick. Um, um, there's five stops in Grants Pass. Starts off at the Black Bear Diner in north end of town, picking up the kids and adults that want to ride out to Wildlife Images. Then it proceeds into the Redwood Hotel, it, uh, picks up people there. Then to 6th and G Street downtown Grants Pass, there's a stop. Then it goes down to Hellgate, and then finally over to the lodge at Riverside. So it picks up in five different places and runs the people back out to Wildlife Images for their tour and then brings them back into town. It does that three times a day. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, of course, if you see this expedition transport, it's, it's um, dark green, right? And right. it looks like it's right out of a set of Indiana Jones. I mean, it is absolutely perfectly done. And uh, what a treat. I bet the kids love it. Oh, they absolutely. It's, uh, they want to ride on it, even if it's just going to get gas. It's just, <laughs> it's just such a cool vehicle. And when I came up with the idea, it was sort of like, uh, can we really pull this off? And thanks to people like, you know, Evergreen and Hellgate, sort of the partners that got into that thing, they pulled it off big time. You would have to have a fleet of these vehicles. It, we could probably use a fleet of these vehicles. Yeah, it's a, it's going to be extremely popular during the off season. It'll be used for wine tours and all sorts of things. And it's a great, you know, it's a traveling billboard for us. So God, it's a good that's... chance for people to get exposed to what we're doing. Exactly. Well, it's an opportunity. And wildlifeimages.org is the website. They've redone that. You can check it out. 
Do yourself a favor this summer and get out to Wildlife Images. They're open year-round. And uh, I don't have the... Dave, give me the phone number. Uh, 541-476-0222. Yeah, it was the 476 part that I got. You want to mess up. <laughs> uh, we've got Ken Goddard in the studio with us this, this morning as well. And talking about the relationship with the Forensics Laboratory and your agents around the world and utilizing wildlife images, that you have now, because of this live research area so close, any of the uh, research, and you just mentioned a research coming up, you can now set up a, a scene that they could forensically uh, go through a dry run. Well, we're actually going to be training the trainers, uh, the, uh, training uh, senior rangers from the Philippines and from uh, most likely Kenya first. Uh, we'll be coming out here, and we're going to uh, set up scenes probably using road kills um, to, to mimic an elephant rhino and uh, work them through a crime scene investigation. And it's going to be a lot safer than doing it in Kenya. Uh, as was explained to me, they've got a problem when you do that out in the Kenya uh, training ranges, the uh, hyenas and lions show up and walk <laughs> away with your, um, <laughs> your exhibit. I, I probably need a change of shorts about that time. <laughs> with the hyenas and the lions. I yeah. just, uh, I'm, I'm counting on wildlife images being a little toned down from that. <laughs> Yeah, we're fresh out of hyenas and lions, so we're all right. <laughs> but, you know, uh, being, you know, wildlife images enabled me to answer a really interesting quest question that was posed to me when I was in China. I was presenting our laboratory to a bunch of Chinese scientists, and finally one of them raised their hands. I wasn't getting much of a response, and they said, you know, Mr. Goddard, we just don't understand why your country is spending so much money to protect animals that you don't eat. That you don't eat, right? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, and I, I, th I thought the concept of endangered species was pretty clear, and, and it obviously wasn't. But having them come to us, showing our laboratory, then taking them out to wildlife images and seeing ah. the, uh, the interaction with, with the creatures, um, you're really telling an interesting story there. It's not just us, the federal government, you yeah. know, saying something, you know, they're turned over to Dave, you know, private enterprise, and, and seeing uh, not only what he does, but his, his own love for the creatures and, you know, his staff and the people who come visit. They walk away educated. They've got to be, it's got to be the most profound thing ever because exactly what you just said, why are you protecting animals that you don't eat? Yes, yes, that's not always obvious to uh, some people. Well, in China, I, I was out there, I, I made two trips, I think in total I've seen two squirrels and one bird. I, I wasn't just in the cities, I was out in the countryside. Yeah. That's wait, 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 say that again? You were... I, I've seen two squirrels. You were or, in China, though? Yes, out in the countryside, mm -hmm. in total two squirrels live running around and one bird. Yeah, I, I'll have to say I've been in China and spent some time there too and it's that way, the wildlife, it's a wildlife void. In Japan, the same way, you know, all that stuff was considered just a consumable and has been consumed. Like So they weren't protected and the, the, they're gone, they're the citizenry of the country has eaten mm -hmm. these animals. Yes. And that's happening now to the oceans around those same countries because the population density is so great and the, the oceans were always viewed as so vast and so great that the resource would always be there. Now we're finding out that it's really not there. And uh, I think Ken's pushing forward on the science to see how do you protect uh, the marine life too. Well, yeah, and this is the one thing that, I mean, I don't know how much exposure you get uh, nationally or locally related to poaching worldwide scene, and it's a huge industry. It, it is a huge industry. It's, uh, it's ongoing, it's constant, it's so hard to, to stop. It's hard to detect uh, because it's happening out in the in the wilds. Uh, you're, you know, there's very few law, wildlife law enforcement officers, especially out well, the Philippines, what seven thousand islands. No, oh, that's that's and, shocking. And how, really. how do you even? How begin? would you even? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the island, the coastline of seven thousand islands. That's it's that, not not doable. No. Yeah, uh, and we're going to try. We're going to try to help. Uh, you know, forensic technology only goes so far. Uh, it's education is what counts, and, and that's where Dave kicks in. We, the, the people have to understand uh, that there's a reason to maintain your wildlife, not just because you're waiting to eat it later. Uh, there's much more to it. it it's, it, it's just, I'm shocked. I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about this. The levity of this whole situation is, is so big. Well, it, we we're uh, in Africa. They were, we're cutting the horns off the rhinos uh, to keep... The, the wildlife managers were trying to keep the poachers from killing them, and we found out the poachers were told to kill them anyway, because the sooner uh, rhinos go extinct, 
the sooner their their oh. catches of, of horns will be infinitely valuable. I was going to say the supply and demand. So kill the rhinos anyway, yeah. and they... The horns become much more valuable, one generation profit. And there's a dark humored aspect to this, too, uh, yeah. which uh, I'm talking to this wildlife manager. It turns out that the female rhinos really aren't interested in the guys once they've lost their horn. <laughs> they had to they had to make uh, fiberglass horns and bolt them onto the guys before the girls would take an interest and I, I thought that was hysterically funny but the guy is glaring at me didn't think so because no. he, he had to he was the one who had to bolt the horns back on yeah, well there would be that job of bolting yeah. the yeah. horn back to the rhino yes i would not have to even approach can you only imagine that's something right out of the movie you have a rhino that's been cut so uh, he's angry that he had his horn cut. One would think. <laughs> <laughs> and then here you are approaching this rhino with this replacement horn. Uh, he sees you. He sees that horn. No dice. Well, but you guys explain. Hey, the, the girl, you know, girlfriend over there. She, she's she's going to be much more amiable. Uh, yeah, they, uh, they, they probably would sedate the rhino. Oh yes, yes, uh, they absolutely. Would knock him yeah. over, and he yeah. would wake up with a new horn. Uh, yeah, that's that's a bunch of work. I mean, it's scary. These are well, that's yeah. where you get back to somebody like Dave, who who knows how to handle these creatures. They're really difficult to sedate. They're more sensitive to sedation than a small deer. So the dosage for a rhino, believe it or not, is very very small for that isn't size that, animal isn't that and something? we don't know exactly what the metabolism is it changes but they're very very sensitive to drugs and that sort of thing so they have to be handled very carefully and one thing that's kind of neat that humans invented that's going to help so save the rhino we hope is things like viagra because the horns were used oftentimes powdered and thought of as a medicinal drug to help males you know do their thing right and now they've got a drug that actually does do that and so maybe that'll take some of the pressure off the rhinos any of them missing their horns. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> a little dose of that. A yeah. dose of uh, Viagra. Well, that's just, it's... We're, uh, we're constantly dealing with culture. I and mean, we do it at the lab all, all the time with uh, well, American Indians. Do they have the right to kill bald and golden eagles for religious purposes? Well, in some cases, yes. Their, their traditions were such. And we're not going to interfere. Uh, if they, their tradition is to, to kill a bald or golden eagle, make it into a dance band for a manhood ceremony. But we don't want them selling that dance van on the street corner to a tourist. Right, right. So exactly. then you get into an interesting discussion of what is a religious activity and what isn't, and that that's always treacherous ground to begin with. Uh, you don't before you even bring wildlife stuff into it. It's just amazing. It really, because you like uh, Ken, like you just said, the culture around the world, and the animals and the wildlife that are there, the the ecosystem and the economy around based off of that, and then you fast forward into what you see in the laboratory is just fascinating and how they operate criminally and then you bring in the live animal aspect of what mm -hmm. wildlife images this is just a fascinating topic it this is it is and, and uh, i'm enthralled by the end result of seeing that these groups come to our laboratory go you know spend the day at wildlife images and generally we see them the next morning and they're talking to each other with a whole different perspective it's things they just hadn't thought about and they said, we're starting to understand why, why this makes sense. Yeah. And what else it does. One of the last things, Dave, of course, um, wildlifeimages.org, you want to go on to the website. And, and Ken's website is uh, www.lab.fws.gov. Yes. You want to get onto the site and check that out. And there's some stuff for kids on there, too. We've uh, uh, sort of a junior wildlife forensics uh, training course on how to identify feathers and hides and things like that. Very cool. I wanted to talk to Dave. Uh, there is a baby bald eagle that you have. There is indeed, yes. And so this is behind the scenes. Can't see it because you've. it's going to be released at this point. Absolutely. I mean, right. So how long... Would it take before it gets to that release stage? Another year? Or? Uh, it depends on the, the bird and how it progresses. It's doing very well. It was We were called by U.S. Fish and Wildlife District 1 headquarters up in Portland. There was a baby bald eagle that was in a nest that fell down in the Olympic Peninsula. There was three baby bald eagles. Only one survived. And we had a pair of bald eagles that were very broody. They were trying to lay eggs and copulate in their exhibit. Had shared that information with the uh, Fish and Wildlife, and uh, they said, gosh, would you consider th taking those two birds off of public exhibit, putting them into an off-exhibit area, and then introducing this young bald eagle and see if they'll foster raise this, this baby eagle. And we didn't know if it was going to happen or how it would happen and all that, but of course we agreed to doing it. 
uh, took the bald eagles, our bald eagles, isolated them, set up, built a nest. We built uh, all the facilities to house this little guy. And then, of course, the introduction is always the scary part because those adults could take that baby apart in no time at all because it's just a little ball of fuzz that fit in your hand. And uh, the parents, we introduced the youngster in a cage first just to see how the adults would do around the youngster. Um, curious, they looked around, stomped around it, and uh, so finally after a couple of days, we had to make the big shift. You took the lid off. Took the cage, took the little one out of the cage, put it in the nest platform. Within five minutes, the female was feeding that baby, pulling meat off of uh, bones and feeding the baby, and it was so neat to see that. So now she is extremely protective. Whenever we walk back to feed or whatever, boy, she wants to take you on. It's like, don't get near my baby. And so- Isn't that something? That's the best situation in the world. If you can have the parents raise the babies, they grow up knowing their baby bald eagles. They know how to relate to other eagles. They'll be good candidates for breeding and reproduction in the, in the future. And hopefully this year we'll be able to take that youngster out and release it back into the wild. Unbelievable. So that comment, I like I'd say something about the generosity of this guy. Um, they had an eagle that would, was injured, and they probably spent several thousand hours rehabbing the whole thing. He, he and his staff. He called me up and said, "Hey, you want to do something fun?" I said, "What's that?" He said, "You want to release an eagle?" I hadn't done a lick of work on that. <laughs> uh, I got to go out there holding this the, eagle. Well, in my well you have to think. I mean, this eagle with this claws and this well, beak and. Uh, well, I'm just. Well, he gave me gloves. I've got this on, <laughs> and he had it hooded, and uh, it's big. And he said, "Okay, you got to throw it up high, otherwise it's going to land back on you. You got a problem." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he I unhooded it. I flung the thing up there. It it flapped its wings, took up, started coming back towards me. Uh, uh, I have no idea how to, <laughs> you know, deal with an eagle on my arm right. like that. Flew over my head and soared away. It was such a wonderful feeling that I got to enjoy thanks to my buddy. I owe him deeply. <laughs> I mean, this is this is just, I mean, I would, I'm not going to say this is an everyday occurrence, but Dave, with you and the animals, uh, you want, you are just world class and all of your group, your your crew out there, they really, really do a great, great job. And I was telling, I was talking to, the, the, to our audience earlier, you can tell the animals are happy, they're healthy, and they're enjoying their existence out there because of what you do. Well, I'd like to think so. And, you know, like the experience with Ken and seeing somebody like that release the eagle and to see that inside, you know, what that it changes your life, your perspective, definitely. And I'd like to have more people have that opportunity, you know. Wow. And so if people are interested in joining us for releasing their members at Wildlife Images, get a, give us a call because during the uh, middle to late summer, we're releasing all kinds of animals back out in the wild. It may be squirrels, maybe skunks, maybe something else, but just being part of the activity is pretty interesting. So if they're interested in their members, you know, give us a call. Maybe we can schedule something. Well. Oh, yeah, and the, the yearly membership fees are minimal, the family yeah. memberships. And once again, the phone number, 541-476-0222. Wildlife Images, Dave and Ken, you guys have just been great. I so much appreciate your, your time this morning. And wow. This is fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're just, we're just getting going, too. Absolutely. We're just getting going. So, well, that's kind of the song. We got to go. I want to thank uh, Ken Goddard, uh, the lab director from the uh, National Forensics Laboratory in Ashland, for coming out. Thank you so much. And uh, Dave, thank you so much for coming over from Wildlife Images this morning. And uh, just can't wait to hear more great animal stories from everything. <laughs> Glad to do it. Yes, All right. Thank you much. All right. We'll be right back. More on the Sunrise Show. We return about 65 degrees out. Oh, okay. I'm all jacked up now. Back after this. Even rock and roll can music save your mortal soul and can you teach me how to dance real slow? Stay tuned. Sunrise will return in a moment on KCMX News Talk 880.